the idea for this presentation kind of began when I'd started um, playing around with Python. And then I looked back to some of the crypto challenges that they did at the Seesaw CTF and thought, ooh, let's see if I can do that with Python. So I throw a couple of these up in Twitter and then Wolfgang says, why don't you do a presentation on it? So that's where this ball got to rolling. And I call this an overview of Python. Flying made simple without the NyQuil hangover. And this is where the interesting title came from. Everyone loves XKCD. Well, here's the agenda. I'll tell a quick little about me, quick little history about Python, our history of Python, a bit about Python, some of the Python everyday uses, and I threw in a little couple of slides on some Python basics. I call it Python 101. Most anyone who already knows any kind of scripting, these are just some of the things that I notice immediately where Python's different. And that idea came from Dave Kennedy, who sent this off and got a review from, so he suggested that. And then I go into the Seesaw Crypto Redux. So the stuff that Wolfgang and Matt did with Seesaw, I did again in Python. And then I throw in some extra credit, throw in some resources, plenty of links where you can start diving into learning Python every which way but loose. And then some tips and tricks and observations that I've made along the way. Now, who am I? I'm a husband, father, geek, and I easily get distracted by shiny things. My career path switched to IT back in 1999 and been professionally an IT guy since 2001. I started the Amplisec career path switch in 2009 when I lost a job, and I'm crossing my fingers hoping to officially become an Amplisec professional in 2012. I've been playing with VBScript for since 2007 and just started playing with Python. I will give the disclaimer, I am nowhere near a code monkey, so I just go from there. Now here's a little history of Python. It was conceived in the late 1980s by Guido Van Rossum at CWI. It was designed to be a successor to the ABC program language. And Guido's one of the, many of the open source community who they've given the Benevolent Dictator for Life title. He's currently employed at Google where he spends half his time working on Python development. Python 2.0 came out in October 2000, contained a whole lot of new features including full garbage collector, Unicode support, but one of the biggest changes was development process. Python 3.0 was released in December 2008. Many new features have been backported to Python 2.6 and 2.7. Now about Python. What is Python? Python is a general purpose, high level programming language whose design philosophy emphasizes code readability. One of the things that you'll notice once you really start dissecting Python scripts, the stuff makes sense. I can look at some, like, when I first started looking at VBScript, I'm looking at it like, this is a whole new language I cannot understand. But Python, it makes sense. Uh, Python claims to com combine remarkable power with very clear syntax, and its standard library is very large and comprehensive. Its, its use of indentation for block delimiters is unique among popular programming languages. Why is it called Python? Of course, Monty Python's Flying Circus. It was one of Guido's, or when he began implementing Python, Guido Van Rossum was also reading the published scripts from Monty Python's Flying Circus. Van Rossum thought he needed a name short, unique, and slightly mysterious, so he decided to call the language Python. The built-in IDE that's in Python, oh, here's a silly little fun fact, it's named after a guy who's in Monty Python, Eric Idle. What is Python good for? 
Python comes with this large standard library that covers areas such as string processing. Uh, there's a lot of internet protocols, software engineering, operating system interfaces, and artificial intelligence, even though I've never got into that yet. There's extensive use in security industry, including exploit development, network, debugging, reverse engineering, fuzzing, web, forensics, malware analysis, PDF. Um, if you go to the exploit database, there's a lot of exploits started off on Python because they can turn it around real quick. It's easy to write short scripts for some system admin stuff. Uh, Python code is easy to understand. Once you start learning some of the basic syntax, even the most complicated scripts can make sense. Python is also cross-platform. You can take a script you made on Windows, run it on Linux and Mac. It, it, it's just that easy. And the other thing, there's a huge amount of resources and a huge friendly community. So you can always ask questions and I've even ran into a couple of forums and talked to some on mailing lists. I got the answers I was looking for. Now this is one of the things I found where Python's used in everyday life. The Yahoo Maps and Yahoo Groups a lot of Google code is based on Python and Shopzilla, even though I forgot to look up what that one was. Uh, some of the more famous and known security tools, Scapy, that is all Python based. It is an extremely powerful interactive packet manipulation program. It can be, it can essentially replace HPing, ARP spoof, ARP SK, ARP ping. POF and even some parts of NMAP, TCP, TCP dump, and T-shirt. And then here's one that I recently ran across, Scrapey. It's essentially a fast, high-level screen scraping and web crawling framework used to crawl websites and extract structured data from their pages. I have yet to play with that one, but that's on the agenda. Okay. And speaking of social engineering, the social social engineering toolkit, that is all Python based. And the other recent tool that Dave Kennedy came out with, Artillery, that's Python based. And then there's W3AF, the Web Application Attack and Audit Framework. And Pitbull, a Python based flexible IDS IPS testing framework shipped with more than 300 different tests. Now here's some other stuff that I've seen that everyday use where Python has been. BitTorrent, Dropbox, uh, some video game Civilization 4, Battlefield 2, I think most of the video games at the extra customization that's the Python basin. Industrial Light and Magic, uh, The Phantom Menace and The Mummy Returns, they're ones listed uh, where Python was used. And Walt Disney Feature Animation, uh, it's used in science with NASA and the National Weather Service. There's even GUI frameworks, TK Enter, PyQt, and WX Python. I started playing with PyQt, but I have the time to get as deep as I wanted to. Uh, and you can see some of the other stuff where it's, there's one, a couple where it's embedded as a scripting language. And Mark, I think that's an audio player, uh, GIMP, uh, Maya. Google uses Python. And also Reddit, the CIA, website uses Python. There's other Python implementations, C Python, Iron Python, which is for .NET and Mono platforms, and Jython, Python coded in Java. Now here's some of the Python basics, some of the stuff you might immediately notice. Indentation does matter. Like the first column, if true, colon, the next line down, 
that is all considered one block of code. If there's a, let's see, where is it? The, the next column over, the bottom line, where if it's not lined up with the colon, it'll produce an error. The if, if else, and if else if statements, they're, they seem really easy. Like if x equal or if whatever expression and do this statement. And all the scripts are considered modules. Anything that's inside Python is an edit editable script, but you can also import that in and use functions from those scripts. You can either import the whole script in or import certain functions of that script. It's got built-in help. Like let's say the first column where you you import the sys library and the hash lib. Just from a Python prompt, you can type help colon sys and get all the information or help hash lib. Or you can type pydoc space and then the module and get all of the documentation information. You can even go into the help on the methods where you don't have to get the entire help information for the sys module. You can get it just for the sys argv. You can also run it interactively. So instead of creating a long script and then running it, seeing it break, if you want to run through a piece at a time, you can run it via, via the command prompt. And one interesting item that I ran across, um, it's an application that it's best suited in Linux. It's called DreamPy. It's almost like a shell on steroids. Idle, that's the built-in Python IDE. You can run, run it interactively through there, too. Now, what inspired this idea? When I was at DerbyCon, I found a book. <laughs> a cool book, coding for yeah, coding for penetration testers. Yes. So, and with the way I kind of learn things, I cannot start off with a basic book where the first script is print hello world. I get easily bored, so. I kind of took two approaches where it was partial from the Coding for Penetration Testers book. And like I said earlier, part of the inspiration for this, the Seesaw CTF. Which incidentally, the presentation you did for the Seesaw and some of the things that you're commenting on today, you don't want to go back up on the YouTube channel. And if anyone's seen the Seesaw CTF presentation, you might recognize this little slide. It was a little spy versus spy. We had C sharp and we have PowerShell. I did C sharp and Matt did PowerShell. And as you know, Matt's not in the room today, which just means that C sharp won! <laughs> <laughs> so I decided to look at them differently. This is my approach when I decided to dive into this. And I decided to bring in a new spy to the game. We brought in Python. If anyone doesn't recognize, that's from Team Fortress 2. My approach for the post Seesaw Crypto Challenges, where Matt and Wolfgang did one script, I kind of tuck it up a notch and decided to do three different. The encrypted message being inside the script, where the output was decrypted. The second one was the encrypted, encrypted message can be used as an argument when calling the script, and the output is decrypted. And the third one, an encrypted message can be read from a file for decrypting. And the overall goal was to have one module for decrypting each decrypt decryption style as a method. I had originally aimed to do a fourth one too, where it would pop up like a little input box, but I found out there was a 255 character limit, so that one got scrapped. 
So here's my overall scoreboard. For the binary, I found a little code excerpt online, and I'm not ashamed to admit that I found where someone else already invented the wheel. And I didn't get to challenge six on, and I'll explain why I didn't make that further on down. So most of these are going to go kind of fast because it's just kind of rehashing. The first crypto challenge, uh, that was the Unicode, right? And there was the answer. Welcome to the 2011 NYU Poly blah, blah, blah. So we have Wolfgang's code, we have Matt's code, and we have my code. That's the entire script where the encrypted message is inside the script. No. So I created a variable and gave the encrypted message as the variable. Now here's the second script where you can call it from a argument. And here's the third, where it just opens up the text file, reads it, spits out the information. The second one was hex. So we see a bunch of hex. There's the answer. There's Wolfgang's code. There's Matt's code. And there's my code. I had to shrink the font just to kind of fit all. But there's the second option where it's called from the argument. And then here it reads it from the text file. And here's the binary. There's the answer we've all seen. There's Wolfgang's code, Matt's code. And there's my code. The one that I hadn't learned about yet was the lambda function, and I still have yet to dive into that for other reasons, but it I was able to use that through all three of the scripts for the binary and had to write it to had to use a different method to output the information. And then there's the third one where it reads from the text file. And base 64. This one was the first one that I'd stumbled across that, hmm, let's see if I can do this in Python. And the built-in module was already there. So there's the answer. There's Wolfgang's code. There's Matt's code. And there's my code. It was essentially three lines. And then here it is, call how to use it from an argument. The sys module is the important one. That's I think it's the sys dot the R B method for the sys. And then here it is reading it from a text file. So essentially five lines and it can read it from a text file. This was the rot 13. So there's the ciphertext. There's the answer. Wolfgang's code, his was a little bit long. His uh, had a lot more functionality to it. It looked like it would go through, through all 26. So there's part two and part three. I don't think. That's not what it said. Wolfgang took a real long way to do it. Yours was more efficient. Let's just yeah. I don't think Matt did that one, so he had no code. There's my code. Three lines, because rot 13 was already built-in function. There's the second one, where the encrypted message can be used as an argument when calling the script. Reading it from the file. 
Now for my final one. Yeah. Now for the final one, the encrypt decrypt module. I was aiming to add the encrypt functionality, but I couldn't get to it in time. So that's the gist of it. Once you import this script in, here's how you can do it. You import the script in seesaw underscore crypto and seesaw crypto dot whatever method, uni underscore dot decode, then put in the variable and it will spit up the decrypted message. I was I had it on my intentions to give different encoded messages to see the different decoded, but I stuck with that. And that's the next screenshot where it goes into the binary, base 64, and ROT 13. I decided to try to do a little extra credit. From my time at DerbyCon, where I got a book. These are the different scripts that are in the book. Uh, let's see, the web check. There's two different web checks. Uh, I think I was trying to rush through the first portion of it. You can monitor a web server, verify if it, if it remains up. Um, the thing that I learned about it, using script arguments, connect to a web server and run a GET request. That one I was able to do. The other web check where you monitor the web server, verify it remains up. It, you could specify a different port, but it would default to port 80. That one, I might have done something wrong or didn't set up the test right. So I marked that one down as a not a success. It was a subnet calculator. Calculate, calculate subnet mass, broadcast address, network range, and gateway from the IP slash CIDR. What I learned from it, parse out values programmatically, is math functions with variables, display results, and using for loops. That one I got to work. There was a pass.py. Determines if users are using the original default assigned password. The main thing with that was using the crypt module. Yeah, I didn't get that one to work. I don't think I'd set up my little test environment right. And the robot parser is supposed to retrieve paths that are in the robot.txt of particular web servers that you specify. And that's one that I kind of went back to but didn't have time to really dive into. So I'm calling that one. I, I didn't get that one to work. There was a root check checks to see what permissions or logged in account has. If you're a normal user, root or system account. That one I got to work. The main thing I learned using if and else if conditional statements. There's a read shadow. Checks to read to see if you have permission to read the Etsy slash shadow. And the main thing learning from that, testing permissions on files to see if current credentials can read the file. That one I got to work. Network socket. Connect to a website and pull down the contents. That one was originally hard-coded. I was going to try to warp it to use arguments to where you could specify the web server. I didn't get to that, but this one I was able to get to work. And the main thing with that, learn network socket creation and learn that spaces will bite you in the ass where you least expect it. Let's see, network socket argument. Connect to a website, pull down contents, site specified by argument. Yeah, I guess I did do that one. And more or less learn the same two previous things. The server connect one, once a connection is made, it sends back a particular string. That one I got to work. The server shell, I forgot to put what the function and what I was supposed to learn from it. And then the last two, receive ICMP and send ICMP. This is where Scapy came in. The main function was to receive the file from the system via ICMP in conjunction with the send ICMP. And the other was to send the file back. 
those, I was able to get work. Yes. So if you get into a network that's under ten thousand dollars, you may not be able to get the key, you may not be recognizing that system. Bingo. So you can ping out a whole file. Bingo. Well, here are all the scripts. I've embedded them in zip files, and I will have this presentation up on my blog for whoever wants to take it and play with these scripts and do what have you. Um, I include the Seesaw crypto module, and I also include two different network traces where the one is the trace when I was doing the SCAPI file send, and then the other, the server connect. And I also include two extra scripts for my extra, extra credit. My Twitter status update and the Twitter account connect. And I'll go into those in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I did a There you go. <laughs> also part of coding for penetration testers, there was an exploitation chapter, and I had to sign myself extra extra credit for that, but I have to mark myself as incomplete. And here's why. A little something came along December 23rd, well actually the 1st of December my wife went in the hospital. And he came out December 23rd, so I've been distracted. <laughs> Rightfully so. Not yet, but I think he'll pick up Python first. <laughs> but, yeah. But I put the disclaimer at the bottom. Once I do get this done, I'll post it up on, up on my blog. Scapey. Scapey, scapey, scapey. Scapey is a very interesting tool and has a serious metric ton crap of functions where you can do all kinds of neat little things. You can do packet creation, you can read PCAP files, create graphical, graphical dumps. One of the ones that I created was a, I think it was a trace route, and that was pretty neat. You can do fuzzing, you can send and receive packets, TCP tra trace route, and you can do a graphical dump of that as well. Sniffing, send and receive files through alternate data channels, that may not be the right term, but I did it through ICMP. You can ping, ARC ping, ICMP ping, TCP ping, and UDP ping. Wireless frame injection, OS fingerprinting, you can send a classic attack of malformed packets, ping of depth, and that nest attack, even though I don't think I've heard of that one. I just copied this from my scapey page. Arp cache poisoning. What's that? That may be. Arp cache poisoning. You can do send scan, act scan, XMIS scan, IP scan, TCP port scan, and IKE scan. You can do advanced trace routing, TCP send trace route, UDP trace route, DNS trace route, VLAN hopping. You can do wireless sniffing and you can do firewalking. Yeah. Firewalking is, I believe, is something to. Um, Testing the open ports on a firewall. Uh, okay. Okay. 
Okay. And, uh, and therefore, staff from staff out, you can figure out how far that device is to the port, to the end of that port. Okay. From the firewall, and potentially get IP addresses of the devices that are inside there, hmm. and they are back to you. Okay, okay. I remember the basic, the basic definition, so thanks a lot. Let's say I've got an internal network address. I'll use this data to rewrite the access source address of it. So you know. get a different internal IP address. You're doing that on the firewall of some device. Right. Right. And nowadays, most firewalls have configured that they won't let their internal IP addresses come through the firewall. Right. Right. Now, if there's something that I'm thinking of, it's simply my brain that associates that. Yeah, it's, it's a way of mapping what's available and where it is in the infrastructure behind it. Especially nowadays, a lot of people tend to do things like, oh, let's look up my uh, AS400 so that you can get it from the internet. Yeah. You mean we're not supposed to do that? You, you are supposed to do that. Okay. It makes it <laughs> That's like hooking SCADA up to the internet, yeah. right? I had aimed to do some extra, extra, extra credit, but well, I kind of got distracted. So these were the ideas that I was going to try to come up with. I was going to try to come up with a URLD obfuscator, and I think this came from uh, some back and forth with Radis on Twitter. I was going to try to create a word list creator, but well, I got distracted. I'll admit it. Now here's some little gems that I'd found along the way that I thought I'd share. There's Python nmap, essentially a Python library which helps using, use nmap, where you can run nmap commands and script out different nmap scans through Python. Saw there was a Python API to virtual box VM allow you to control every aspect of virtual machine configuration and execution. And then there's Pi to EXE. Pi to EXE is Python dist, DIST utils extension which converts Python scripts into executable Windows programs able to run without requiring a Python installation. And it it's like it compiles enough needed Python to where you can run your script. And it works pretty good. I tried one or two of the scripts that I created to convert them over to EXEs. I would use it. It, it works good. That I was curious of for the artillery. That may be. I found some various Chrome extensions and applications. There was a uh, Three that really jumped out at me. There was a Python shell where you you just add it from the web store, and it just adds a little browser button where, bam, you can bring up a Python shell. And there was a Python shell Chrome application, and then there was an online Python development environment. That one was was pretty cool to play with. Where you can. Create your scripts and walk through them and easily troubleshoot them. Okay, so it's not going to give you any advantage in poking around at somebody else's website. That's what we were, we were actually discussing that before when we got here. Could you access the DOM through? Well, uh, you would ask that about the, uh, the Chrome extensions? Yeah. But through a regular Python shell? That I'm not sure. I'm, Probably not at that level, but it wouldn't surprise me if you could. And one one of the main things I could think for using Python shell, Scapy. Import the Scapy library in and run the commands through that shell. Or yeah. 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 
basically your own uh, project within Chrome. Which is yeah. Data yeah. yeah. One of the uh, other little gems I found, uh, Tweepy. It seemed to be about the best Python library to interface with Twitter. I tried to play with some of the other ones and couldn't really make it that far. So here was my little demo of it. I've got the link to the at the very bottom where I'd followed those instructions and was able to create Taz Drummer's handy little Python script, Python or Twitter app. So there at the top, I'm giving the uh, status update to Wolfgang. There's a screenshot of it. I have a lot of links to share. And python.org is a really good place to start, but I found these other ones along the way. Found some extra tools on this Mashable site, and it found you could see a lot of online exercises to kind of help learn it better. And yes, that is the, um, let's see, what is it? Uh, which movie is it? The Monty Python movie? I'm drawing Holy, Grail. Holy Grail. That's the little rabbit down in the corner. <laughs> There's free online videos. Uh, found an online book. And found three different sites where there's like an online interactive tutorial interpreter. Here's some forums. It, they seem very helpful. Module package repository. The Python package index has, uh, I think the last count was about 17,409 packages. So I always believe in right, not reinventing the wheel. Someone else may have done it. I go out there and look for it. The active code, active state code recipes, that page can be a little flarky with Chrome. Just kind of be warned of if one browser seems to have problems, Try another browser because I ran into some weird quirkiness. And then I found a page, Python Tools for Penetration Testers. And there is a lot of tools on there. Can we get out to the internet? So let's pop this open. No, no. <laughs> I was about to say, you can get on the donut, <laughs> touch anything. You can see all the network tools. No, I don't. KP. <laughs> really for, no. for good reason, probably. <laughs> you can see all the different tools. There's a lot of debugging and reverse engineering. A lot of fuzzing tools, web tools, forensics. And all of this is all Python based. So here's some of the books that I kind of flipped through and was able to use throughout this preparation. The learning, for, learning Python seemed a little bogged down. Programming Python, that one was geared more toward Python 3.1. Right now the big major one that everyone's using is Python 2.7. A lot of the main meat and main extra spin-offs that came from Python, especially uh, Twisted. Has it been ported over to Python 3 yet? The foundations of program, Python network programming, that one's really good. And the beginning Python from novice to professional, that one's good too. And it covers some Python and gray hat hacking and gray hat Python. That one's a little above my head for now. But I'm going to refer back to that one because that one looks like it has a lot of good info too. Here's some tips and tricks that I kind of figured along the way. As I said, I'm nowhere near a code monkey, but I always like to use an IDE. And of, here's a link for where all of the Python 
IDEs are kind of listed off the main Python side. For Windows, I really, 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 really like PyScripter. That one is pretty darn solid. Um, the, the code completion on that is top notch. Aptana Studio is pretty good. And then you got your standard idle. That one's good in a pinch. And Ninja, uh, that one was okay. PyCrust, it was kind of a kind of a half IDE, half shell. And for Linux, of course you got Idle, you got Genie, Python Toolkit. SPE seemed to be about the one that really stuck out for me. That one has pretty good code completion. Eric, it's supposed to have auto complete of code, but I haven't quite figured out how to get that to work yet. And PyCrust is there too, but DreamPy. I really like DreamPy. It's kind of like a shell on steroids. Sure. Yes. I didn't list it because I didn't have a chance to play with it, so I didn't want to go saying, yes, it's good, or yes, it's bad, without even having really known. But there's a lot of other IDEs that I didn't list. I only listed the ones that I had actually uh, played around with. Um, Okay. Okay. Well, I'll give a quick show of all the IDEs. You can see there's a lot. Komodo, NetBeans, PyCharm, PyDev, PyScripter, PyShield, Spider. I started to play with that one and I didn't like it. And these up here are just for the basic code completion, the integrated debugger. And then here's where it either has code completion or integrated debugger. And it lists the OS that it's mainly for. And then for your just plain straight editors, Notepad++ is one that I've liked for using with Python. And for Linux, gedit or SCITE, and I'm sure I may be saying that wrong. What? Uh, no? Well, I'm just getting into Linux even deeper, so. Here's some tips and tricks for running, <laughs> running scripts on Linux. You can either run from the command line, or run from a shell, Python, and then the script name. But you got to make sure to do the, the pound exclamation mark slash user slash bin slash Python at the top. Give it the path to the interpreter just in case your Python is located at a different spot. Common problem on PyScripter that I had found, the it auto-filled it with the hash bang slash user slash bin slash env python. So when I created a script in Windows, when I tried to run it on Linux, it looked to me like uh, 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 it gave some weird errors. Now for Windows, Windows scripts don't need the, the hash bang, but need to have .py associated with the Python interpreter. Scripts can be double clicked, ran from the command prompt, if a script is double clicked, clicked, you want to make sure to have raw input, raw underscore input, press enter to exit at the end or you'll never see it. It'd be kind of like running start run IP config. You'll see something flash by, but you won't see the results. Portable Python. This is a handy little gem that I found that I just had to share. I found all kinds of portable tools that I found that you can easily run from thumb drive and make life easier. Then I found portable Python. And I can even give a little demo. It works great.
all of that, you can run some commands from your thumb drive and just put it on hard drive. And PyScripter works great as well. So not only does it uh, include that portable Python environment, there's all kinds of Python applications and libraries along with it too. You got your Py to EXE, you can do your Django, WX Python for creating GUIs, and there's even a portable Python 3.2 in case you're up with the latest and greatest. So most of the stuff that works in 2.7 isn't quite ready for 3 yet. Now here's just some extra stuff that I've found. Anti-gravity. When you open module docs and click on anti-gravity module or from idle run import anti-gravity, remember that cartoon at the very front? It opens up a web browser and pops it up to that page. And then there's the Zen of Python. Start the path of finding the Zen of Python. Remember two important words. Import this. From, from an IDE idle or Python shell run, import this, and the Zen of Python will be revealed. See? Beautiful is better than ugly. Explicit is better than implicit. Simple is better than complex. Complex is better than complicated. Flat is better than nested. Sparse is better than dense. Readability counts. Special cases aren't special enough to break the rules. Although practicality beats purity, errors should never pass silently unless explicitly silenced. In the face of ambiguity, refuse the temptation to guess. There should be one and preferably only one obvious way to do it. Although that way may not be obvious at first unless you're Dutch, now is better than never, although never is often better than right now. If implementation is hard to explain, it's a bad idea. If the implementation is easy to explain, it's a good idea. Name spaces are one hawking great idea. Let's do more of those. Now my final thoughts. As I said earlier, I'm nowhere near a code monkey, and Python just seems easy to learn. It, a lot of the code just makes sense, and I can just go out and pick up random Python scripts and just comb through it in no time and start to understand what it's doing. And a lot of the ways I learn, I take what someone else has already done, and I warp it and mutate it to do something else. And with this, it, it's pretty easy. Up next, let's go Ruby. Because I wouldn't mind doing this again and maybe take a Ruby approach. Any questions? Because there's who I am. There's how you can find me. Anyone got any questions? So any Oh, one other cool thing that I found, I think it was in the networking book. Uh, Foundations of Python Network Programming. Toward the beginning, there was a particular module that's out on the Py Python repository where you can set up a little virtual environment. So you can test it first before you really commit it to your Python environment. That's another one that I didn't get a chance to play with, but I've added it to my list. Anyone else? Okay. Because that's one of the chapters in the Coding for Penetration Testers book, so I, I may use this same approach. Because 
I like diving into something where it's you get immediate results, not the little basic kindergarten print hello world, and then ask it what is your name. Print yes. I, I like hitting it from all different angles. And now, InfoSec Village. This is an idea I came up with while I was at DerbyCon. It was an idea that kind of inspired from talking with, I think it was DTOM, where he was going to, from going to one of the particular talks, he asked which one I was going to, and I said, I think this one sounds interesting. And he was going to a different one because it was geared more toward his job. But since I'm not in that line of work yet, I'm in that mode where I want to learn. I want to grab hold of everything and just learn it. But there's just so much that sometimes it's hard to know where to start. And the other portion that kind of inspired it I think it was at the podcaster meetup. Um, I think it was a uh, um, guy from Exotic Liability suggest. Yes, it, he had suggested someone create something where you're teaching people how to do stuff. So the idea kind of formed the whole phrase of it takes a village to raise a child takes a village to teach InfoSec people properly. So I've already had that domain registered. And the idea is to maybe create a, um, oh, what's the name of that site? I'm drawing a blank on the name of the site. That I think it was Wolf, Wolfgang kind of suggested. Hey, Wolf? What was the name of that site where they do the video tutorials? No. Um, Khan's Academy. Khan's Academy. A lot of times where I learn something, it's when I take something and show someone else how to do it. Yeah. And the idea was to maybe create a open source security related cons academy where you can kind of offer up assignments and you take that assignment from someone else and create a desktop presentation showing what you've learned and then to kind of pass that along that's just kind of the basic ideas of it and Usually for something like this, I kind of work better when I bounce ideas off of other people. So I almost think that this this could go somewhere because there may be certain aspects where I want to learn about firewalls, and you may know a lot about firewalls. So you write up here, do this, do this, do this, and I go research it. And then I created a little desktop presentation, a desktop video. Okay, here's what I did. You know what I mean? There was one guy that uh, I can't remember who it is right now, but um, he created a simple blog post that listed from his, his journey on vulnerability development. It started off with, here's how you use MS, you know? And it went down to, here's how to defeat ASLR in depth. And he's like, for each one of those, it kind of gradually, you know, got him more and more technical and in it. But he always, for each one, he referenced at least one. Um, one thing that helped him learn, whether it was a video on security too, yeah. whether it was a book, whether it was some guy's blog post, um, he did that. So it was kind of like a course outline, and I started going through a lot of that, and it was fantastic. So. I don't know, are you thinking about something kind of like that? I guess my original thought was like the whole conference mentality where everyone's teaching everyone. Yeah. Take something from that and put it out there where you can offer up this lesson, where you can learn from this guy and kind of collaborate that way. 
I mean, it, I mean, this makes me think of things like right tests, where there's collections of left tests. Yeah. Because the cost of the topics would simply be more focused on practical infosec. Is that kind of what you have in mind? Something like that. As I said, this is just kind of like basic ideas to, uh, almost along the lines of like a cons academy. Right. But it, like certain areas where I've really grown and what I've learned on something was when I'm showing someone else how to do it. And giving them simple little assignments of, okay, here, do this, this, and this. And then they're able to take that and run with it. So something along that lines. So the, the price of learning is teaching. Yeah. And part of the reason why I've kind of presented this to everyone, I have a new reason to uh, where I kind of seem to run out of time because I'm distracted. So. I think that this could be good to work on as a group. I mean, it almost seems like you create a community of mentors where you would have profiles listed. Yeah. But I'm good at social engineering and some aspects of, of fantastic. Bingo. You're, you're good at coding in, in Python. You're good at coding in, in Ruby. Different people would have different profiles saying, here's what I have to offer. Who is it? Who's interested in talking with me? Mm. This is sort of like um, Match.com for technology. Right, like yeah. <laughs> well, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Don't anyone offer hugs again. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, we, we, no, we, would have, we would have a special okay. pay rate for that kind of equipment. Yeah, <laughs> matching up the, the people who have to I, I could try to answer. Right. So that was how I wanted to end it, is to kind of present that overall to the group and say, would this be something that overall is a group that we could kind of take and run with? I'm definitely open for volunteering to help build that. I think it's a good idea. You know, everybody learns from everybody else. And that was the key right there. Think of. Yeah. Well, was one of the things we were talking about on Twitter the other day, I think I, I mentioned, you know, from new to old, right. old and humble. Mm -hmm. Since you can't learn it all. You start out, you want to learn it all. Yeah. I'd still love to, but I'm not that smart. I'm smart enough to know that I'm not that smart at least. So wherever we want to take this, I already have the domain registered. So What's wrong with it? I think we should think about a infrastructure that would support the kind of model that would allow everyone to, to collaborate in a mentoring capacity. That's the direction you want to go. I know one of the free web hostings, which I kind of use on occasion. To, I, I use it as like a sketchboard. I create some fake little site and just yeah. play with. And one of the I think it was a learning management system. Seemed like it it could be really used for something like this, but I think Moodle. That's it. And I think that Moodle will probably be good. Um, so there it is. Hey, sure. Um, no, no worries. So we'll have to talk about